Welcome to the NERJ NYREJ podcast. I'm your host, Rick Kaplan, and my guest today is Rick Tikoski, and Rick is with Tikoski Millman Architects. Good morning, Rick. Hey, good morning, Rick. How are you? I'm doing great, thanks. So, uh, so Rick, tell me a little bit about yourself, and tell me a little bit about Tikoski Millman Architects and what they've been all about. So I'm a born and bred New Jersey guy. Um, grew up in North Jersey, Roselle Park area, uh, graduate of, uh, NJIT in 1992 for architecture, uh, moved down to the brick area in 2000, uh, built my own house in brick, started my own firm, uh, had two locations, uh, within brick township. And about six years ago, we moved over to wall township and have a new, uh, facility over in wall. Uh, back in the evolution of the firm, uh, back in 2007, Mike Millman joined me. And yeah, that's when we officially became Tokarski Millman Architects. And uh, we've been in primarily K-12 school firm, public bid firm. We do a lot of commercial work, uh, state government. Uh, we also do uh, high-end uh, modern residential projects. So kind of a full gamut of projects. You know, and I've I've been doing a little snooping about you. And uh, when before you started this, you traveled a lot of uh, Europe. And, uh, and yeah, so yeah. you were interested in a lot of the architecture that they had in the, those countries. Yeah, definitely. You know, going through NJIT in school, you see all the great works of architecture. And uh, one of my roommates from college and I decided as soon as we graduated, we we're going to backpack around Europe for a couple of weeks. So. We spent six weeks going uh, through youth hostels throughout Europe. I uh, wound up going to France, Switzerland, and spent a month in Italy. So it was a kind of great culmination of school to be able to go and visit a lot of the great works um, and historic buildings in Europe. You know, it's interesting because me and a few of my friends were sitting around the bar and discussing things, and I don't know how this came up. I, I think it was because of some of the structures that have collapsed recently. And we, we moved on to talk about how come they, when they built these structures in Europe, like in Rome and places like that, they're still standing after all of these years. How did they have that, that, you know, um, that, that know-how of engineering a project like that? You know, it's amazing. Well, I think it was a combination of two things. One, it was uh, a factor of safety way higher than we use now and also free labor. So they didn't have to uh, yeah. you know, get to an economy of things to get things built. Oh, so we should try to get everyone to work for nothing. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah. We can't even get them to work for the for okay. high wages. <laughs> exactly. And I don't even want to go there because then we'll start getting into <laughs> politics and all that. <laughs> then it's, it's never, a, nothing good comes from that. <laughs> so uh, let's start, let's talk more about your firm. Uh, and you said you do a lot of commercial space. And I looked at some of the projects you have done and some of the buildings are some gorgeous looking um, projects that you completed. So yeah, thank you. when you talk about uh, someone that's beginning the stages of a development, at what point do you want them to contact you or any kind of ar architect? Uh, when they have an inkling they want to do something is probably the best time to engage an architect. Uh, a lot of times people reach out to um, contractors first or possibly uh, civil engineers or developer. Uh, architects have a unique skill set where they're kind of a an overall quarterback of things. So we can bring a lot to the table in, you know, selecting the team to put together to make your project successful. And they also have a broad general knowledge over all the disciplines. Uh, so, you know, even as far as, you know, site selection, would a, you know, a particular property be viable for your project? We can look into that, you know, from a bunch of different vantage points and see if it makes sense for the property 
will it host your project versus going out and buying something and finding out later that you can't do what you wanted to with it. Now, does the developer or the property owner have to give you some idea of what they're looking for, or do you have to come up with the idea and then present it to them first? Um, we find scenarios in both cases where, you know, somebody has a specific idea of what they want. They kind of know they've done the research. They know what they want to build or kind of in general what they want to build. And in those scenarios, we do take that into advisement and we'll also kind of take a look at it with fresh eyes and see, you know, is this the best and highest use for the property? Or, you know, a lot of times we'll say, you know, have you, you know, this is great. I understand where you want to go, but have you ever thought about you know, approaching it this way. And we'll bring some ideas and sometimes, you know, it sparks something and other times they're like, no, I specifically, this is what I want. And then we can kind of take what the client or developer wants to do and, you know, add that special touch to it to kind of make it an extraordinary project versus just an ordinary. Now, and this is probably a sore subject right now is uh, AI and architects. Now, I can't believe that someone would go to, uh, would depend on AI to design a, some kind of a project for them. Uh, because there's a lot of other things besides just designing. You know, you have to know the locations, you have to know uh, what the neighborhoods and, uh, you know, all, a lot of uh, other factors go into the design that I don't know if AI even has that capability. Um, I would say it's not the final answer. It is, you know, a very interesting subject at this point. And, you know, in one of my peer groups, we were kind of talking about, you know, AI and the role in architecture. So we decided to ask chat GPT if we we're going to be replaced <laughs> with AI. And it said no. So that was a good sign that they're not trying to completely take over. <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't uh, even yeah. have enough faith in themselves. <laughs> exactly. They still, they even, even, you know, chat GPT knows they need us. But, uh, you know, it's an interesting and, you know, you know, new tech, you know, somewhat new technology. And it's amazing that the results that come out of some of these image creations. And so I think it's definitely going to impact architecture from, you know, probably expanding it from a design standpoint and letting, you know, clients and people kind of explore what options could be. And maybe it'll open their horizons to something new that they wouldn't have thought of. No. Let's go back to what I originally was saying about the buildings in you know Europe and how they engineered that at way back then. And, uh, and now we've had a few buildings that have collapsed. Um, yeah, there was just a garage that collapsed in Ohio, I think it was. New York had one. Uh, the building that was in Florida that collapsed. Uh, is there anything that... I know the engineers have been working on that and now there's bringing in some ins yearly annual inspections that they have to do on properties to verify they're not going to collapse, but that's not in place all over the country yet. But is there any new factors that you have to implement when you're making up your design to kind of um, protect that? No, I mean, I think that in the code, it's always been in there. However, you know, architecture is a team sport. You know, it's not only, you know, what the architect comes up with, but we have a team of, you know, engineers typically on a commercial project where you have structural engineers, civil engineers, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, you know, just to name a few. And there's also other consultants. And then after that whole design gets done, you still have the contractor and all their subcontractors that come to the table. So it's really a complex thing to put a building together. And it's, you know, it's not relying, it's relying on every piece and person that get, is involved in that. And, you know, if there's mistakes along the way, then you have the potential for building failures. So the building could be designed correctly. However, uh, you know, in the implementation of that, if, you know, the wrong size rebar is used, if it's in the wrong place, if the mix of concrete off, you can have building failures. So, you know, you have to have, execution from the design point all the way through construction in order to make it a su successful project. Now, and so and being an architect, you have to have a little bit of knowledge on all of these 
avenues of uh, the the process of building you know as far as you have to know something about construction uh you have to know something about engineering and then designing i think if you don't have all those it's probably very difficult to put together some kind of a design sure um you know as the architect we're considered the quarterback um yeah, we do. When we are at school. We learn about structural engineering, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, to you know a lighter degree than an engineer would. However, as a licensed architect, you can do structural engineering, mechanical, electrical, plumbing. Most of us opt not to um, because we're, you know, in some sense, a generalist. We really rely on the structural engineer and MEP engineers because there's, you know, it's almost impossible to be up to date on all those fields simultaneously and everything that's going on. So we do need to know enough to coordinate all of that and have and guide clients appropriately in their decision making. However, we do rely on, you know, our engineering consultants to be, you know, the experts in each individual area and then we can coordinate that whole package so that the whole thing comes together. So out of all the projects that you have done over the years, is there one particular one that you you just feel that there's such a pride from it happening? Um, there's a number of them. Uh, I'd say there's uh, the Hope Center up in Jersey City uh, was a church slash performing arts center. Um, the ministry was very involved in the arts. Um, was, you know, a lot of the leadership are musicians, and I spent probably close to 10 years, you know, evaluating different sites with the leadership to try and find a location. And we looked at several buildings throughout Jersey City. Uh, we finally found an old uh, bus repair facility on Cambridge Ave up in Jersey City. And we took this old building and rehabbed it. We took the facade off of it, built a new facade for it fit it out and then seeing this like old you know kind of bus facility come you know have a new life with a new facade on it uh, we left remnants of the old brick inside so i really like the mixture of old industrial and new and that combination uh, then seeing that project you know come to life and be able to you know visit and see it full of life and people and ministering to the community was uh, a very rewarding project yeah, that sounds like a, a interesting project. Have you ever seen the new buildings that they have been putting up? And I, I th I've seen them all over the country. It's like a, a Jenga type of looking building. Uh huh. Um, have you done any of those <laughs> type designs? Um. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely it, we've kind of brought that into the modern residential projects we're working on. We have a couple of office buildings in Jackson that we're working on. So I really kind of enjoy that, you know, juxtaposition of materials and forms. Now, how does that not fall over? <laughs> Good structural engineer. <laughs> you know, because you know, it's, it it looks like it's it it has to fall over. You know, it's like one right. end is out this side, you know, one side, the other is out the other side. You know, there's nothing is even. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're using a lot of cantilevers and. Kind of things that you, when you look at, you're like, how is that standing? But, right. You know, that kind of makes for some good architecture. If it's, you know, makes you stop and look and question, you know, if, you know, it's defying gravity. What's going on here? You know, that's yeah, what kind no of makes one, architecture. Uh, yeah, I guess that uh, is showing off your talents. That yeah. you know, uh, it used to be everywhere you looked, the buildings would be square, or at the top they'd have like some kind of a you know, they that have like a peak to it or something like that. Now they have all kinds of funky designs. Yeah. And which I, I mean I, I find that interesting. But but then I go back and I think about well, how does that stay up? <laughs> you know, how does that stand? <laughs> yeah. That all kind of goes back to uh I think you can all credit as uh, like as architects, we can uh, credit Frank Lloyd Wright for that. Uh, he was a famous architect uh, and he, one of the, the most famous American houses would be called Falling Water, which is outside of Pittsburgh, where the architect 
created a house sitting on a waterfall and it's got several levels and decks that cantilever out over the waterfall and every architect loves that house and it resides in our psyche and pops out in new ways. So how do you test that this would be a safe building, you know, with this new design? Uh, it all comes down to engineering principles and math. You know, we have to get the math to work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not good at math, so I wouldn't probably, I would probably be a terrible architect and engineer. <laughs> so uh, you don't want to hire me, but uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Very interesting. And, you know, so being an architect is not just uh, taking a piece of pa paper and, and making that those square blocks. <laughs> There's a lot That's more involved to it. Well, it starts with, you know, starts with that, but we have to actually uh, turn it into something real and usable and energy efficient and weather resistant. But we do like, you know, playing with, you know, shapes and forms and sketching and coming up with, you know, ideas. And that's really what, you know, stimulated me about architecture was um, the art aspect of it combined with the science of actually making it something usable. So they often say that architects are split brained. You know, so they have the, you know, the art side and then the math side. So, you know, a good architect is really sp split brain. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> so have you ever had a client that has come to you with such a funky idea that you said, oh, I don't know if I, that's even possible to do? Um, I can't recall, but usually we're the ones trying to push the envelope and <laughs> convince the clients to do something a little funky. Like the Hard Rock Cafe guitar type thing, where that's the hotel, you know, the mm -hmm. guitar. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, yeah. It becomes a kind of an icon. Right. Right. So no one's coming with you to you with that kind of an idea or a, a funky idea like that. Not with the guitar or well, any, I mean, you know, yeah. an object into a building. But yeah, you, know, you have clients who you know are willing to kind of explore what the options are. And that's really where you can start pushing the envelope of creativity and coming up with something uh, very interesting. Um, it kind of spurs you know, one project that I worked on. I had done um, two residences in brick on the Matita Conca River on this one street. Um, one was a very kind of coastal, colonial type, you know, home. Uh, two doors down, we did a kind of Mediterranean, uh, you know, tile roof stuck on the exterior. And then I had a client who wanted to do something very ultra modern in between the two I had already done. So, you know, obviously I had some conversations with my former clients and said, hey, you know, here's what we're coming up with. You know, I just wanted to kind of talk it over with you because it's going to be your new neighbor. And surprisingly, both neighbors were super supportive. We had to go to the town for some variances because it was a very narrow lot on a on a bluff overlooking the water. And to my surprise, I went into the planning board kind of, you know, with boxing gloves in my uh, bag. And to my surprise, it was very well received. And, you know, some of the board members and the zoning officer was like, that is the coolest house I've ever seen. And we're, you know, we're glad to, you know, to have it, even though it was kind of new for the neighborhood. It was well received, and the clients absolutely loved the project. Now that's kind of a strange because in certain areas you come up with a funky design, and the neighbors just hate it. You know, especially I can tell you in Boston that you know we were talking about that Jenga type of building. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in the area didn't like that design, and they thought it didn't conform with the older architecture that is is surrounding that property. And so they were kind of uh, upset and petitioning to try not to have that project done, things like that, or change the design. Uh, do you run into that? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think there's always a hesitancy of change and, you know, something that's new. Yeah, you know, I think there's a you know definitely a place for historic architecture and you know when you have a, like an historic district you know 
say like you know out in Martha's Vineyard where you have you know very distinctive architecture and it really sets the tone for the neighborhood. Now there's a place to say, hey, you know what, this doesn't belong. Um, however, you know, I'd say the majority of the suburbs and sprawl has always been what was the you know, market driven demand at that point. And, you know, for a long time, it was, you know, your center hall colonials and split levels. And that continued on and on with, the, especially with a lot of the uh, developers where it was, Hey, it was a safe bet, do a center hall colonial, you know, and that's all that happened. However, you know, times have progressed. You know, we're in 2023, heading to 2024. You know, we're not we're not riding horses. We don't drive in wagons anymore. We don't have our horse hitched up to the front post. You know, we're driving electric vehicles and, you know, we have AI and drones and technologies advancing. Our housing should too. Well, now everyone's going to want to, you know, everyone riding bikes and, you know, things like that they want to try to get rid of the cars completely which is never going to happen uh although i was driving through the city this past weekend and i've seen i can't tell you last time i saw so many people riding bikes and just walking the streets that uh they were kind of interfering with the traffic you know because it's not enough sidewalk space or you know bike space for all these people that are using the scooter the, you know the little push scooters and things like that and the bicycles i i i mean i think that's going to be part of your uh you know new designs that they, you have to have more space for the, uh, that type of vehicle or the, or the pedestrians yeah i definitely see that um you know we have our biggest hurdle in New Jersey with every new project that we do, the number one thing is parking. You know, the amount of parking that is required for, you know, to put up a building or facility. And I think as we progress in society, you know, when we're using more ride share, zip cars, you know, I think there's an opportunity to kind of decrease, you know, that requirement for parking and, you know, maybe leave a little bit more, you know, green space, open space, for other uses. Well, you know, that was one of the things that I really, everyone's heard about the big dig that went through uh, Boston and where they were, you know, they had the overhead uh, highway, which went over the city, which was ugly and dark, made the whole city very dark. And then they buried it all and they made the greenway where there's mm -hmm. a lot of green space and a lot of, uh, open area which i thought was crazy at the time but now i go through that i that was a fantastic idea how they did that i don't know because i don't know how it supports all those buildings underground but hey it it's a great idea because it it, it definitely opened up the area i'm surprised that hasn't happened in new york city because you have a lot of those uh, trolleys that are going over the city and and it looks dirty and it's it's kind of ugly i don't know about new jersey new jersey have that as well no not really yeah yeah but you know one of the more successful projects is the high line in new york are you familiar with that no so they took um an old abandoned elevated train tracks and converted it to a public park and it's one of the most successful public parks in new york city they had landscape designers you know, imagine what does an elevated park look like? And it's an amazing destination and a journey. Um, I highly recommend any of your viewers to go check it out. It's an amazing feeling to kind of be elevated up above the street level, walking through New York, walking next to, you know, third, fourth, third or fourth floors on buildings and not having traffic within your view. And you're walking through a park. It's... Huh. A kind of surreal experience and is part of the city underneath that yes yep they have you know it's active you know traffic and streets down below but you're walking in the sky on a park in a park so is it the the traffic and everything is it very dark under there uh yeah we'd say yeah it's still gonna have you know shadows and stuff down below yeah. but uh it's a several mile park that starts at a uh, Jacob Javits center and 
you know, we could spend a nice afternoon up in the sky. Yeah. That's interesting that they come up with, did you ever get a calls for that type of work where you would design like a park for a municipality or a st- city or state? Um, that, that, that kind of realm is more in the civil engineering and landscape architecture realm where we're kind of more focused on the buildings and, you know, we have, projects where we're involved, where we're talking about the exterior and getting involved with landscape architects and coming up with conceptual things. But, you know, in an urban park installation that really falls into, you know, the civil and landscape architecture. Okay. Now I'm going to give you the million dollar question. Office space. (laughs) What's the new concept for office space? (laughs) Um, it's a mixed bag. We know kind of we've heard all about the uh, WeWorks changes. You know that explosion is tailored down. However, in you know certain areas or certain situations, we're still seeing you know the smaller office space um, being a market-driven request. Uh, you know, having a lot of people working from homes and that shift of you know not necessarily working in as much in large cities and working from home more and more, you find companies and businesses that want a small touchdown space or smaller office space. So we actually have a project going on currently where we took a, uh, an old Ramada in and is being converted to small office suites at this point. So we're seeing some adaptive reuse of, you know, a hotel that wasn't viable anymore to create these smaller office spaces. Well, I've also heard of some developers, not a lot because it's very costly to do this, is take office space, existing office space, and make it into multifamily space, which is very difficult, I'm hearing. Mm-hmm. It, so yeah I, would, yeah, I would imagine, yeah, that's a little bit of a, a change and a heck of a lot more plumbing that you need going through right. the building. So I, I, I'm assuming you haven't had a lot of people reach out to you about having that space done uh, to accommodate multifamily. Um, no, we haven't. We've, you know, we've had, you know, apartment buildings and apartment complexes that are, are still getting built. There's still, you know, definitely a housing deficit in New Jersey. But, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting seeing some of the adaptive reuse projects that are going on, especially, you know, with the larger scale, the commercial malls really turning into more entertainment venues and varying destination points than, you know, the traditional big commercial right. retail centers. Yeah, and I would think that would be a little easier to adapt to uh, entertainment because it's not like a multifamily project where you have to have bathrooms or multiple bathrooms added into these places and uh, divide up space into living space, which has to have windows. And, you know, you can't be in the middle of the building where there's no window space, you know, for someone to live. Exactly. Uh, Maybe I do have the talent to be an architect. I don't know. You (laughs) may have something here, Rick. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, everyone's crying. We need more and more multifamily space. And, and and then everyone's crying. We have all this empty office space, you know. There's got to be a way to make it all work, I, I guess, besides okay. tearing it all down. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a more green approach to, you know, do adaptive reuse and see what you can do. I mean, there's probably nothing wrong with the structure of the building. It's just how do you adapt it to its new function and use. And, you know, that's part of the challenge of architecture that, you know, that I love doing is, you know, what's the possibilities of taking something that is, you know, no longer viable for its intended use and what can you make out of it? It's the challenge. You're always up for the challenge. It it makes life interesting and it makes the day go fast. (laughs) That's true. It does. Well, Rick, it's been very interesting to talk with you. Uh, if someone wanted to get a hold of or find out more information about your company, where would they go? Um, you can visit our website at tm architects with an s dot com. Uh, we have very active on social media. Uh, you know, you could also, you know, from that point, 
find us on you know Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, we're also active on House. So we're you know on social media and on the web. You can check out our stuff. We're also located on 1729 Route 35 in Wall, New Jersey, uh, down here on the uh, border of Delmar at the Jersey Shore, which is one of the best places to live in the state. So come on by and visit us. Now you sound you're sounding like a, a used car salesman. Come on down to our. <laughs> Come on down. Yeah, one of those guys out in the, like a flag that blows up and waves up yeah, and down in front. Yeah, we're not that tacky. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, no. It sounds. I. I mean, I went to your website. I saw all the different projects you did, and it's some very nice. You know, you have a little diverse type of uh, portfolio because you do a lot of retail, off, you know, office. I don't know if you're doing a lot of office, but you're doing uh, multifamily. You do multifamily, right? Yeah, we do multifamily. Yeah. Pretty much every project type we've done, you know, ranging from residential to industrial and high hazard. So we a plethora of different projects, and we kind of feel like, you know, that plethora of project diversity, you know, is a broad base for us to draw on for each new project. And if you have a project and you have, it's a challenge, bring it to Rick because he wants that challenge. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> well, thank you, Rick. We're talking with Rick Tikoski from Tikoski Millman Architects. Again, Rick, thank you very much for the interview. Uh, my pleasure. And I'm Rick Kaplan from the New England and New York Real Estate Journal. And until next time, have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rick.